Okay, and welcome to our third and final in the series of Let's Talk Assessment. Um, while we wait for everybody to join us this afternoon, um, you can see on your screen, we've got our panel members. Uh, we're waiting to start the, the discussion session, um, but I know we've got a number of people joining us today um, via the recording, because I think uh, Finn and I were just talking that it was, we hadn't really anticipated the, the state of play of COVID at this time of the year when we postponed from the summer. Um, and I don't think anybody thought we'd be in the situation we're in, still no. in at the moment. So we do really do appreciate everybody that's joining us today, our panel members and all of our attendees. Um, but the recording to this session will go out to everybody um, after the session later on today. So we really do appreciate how difficult school is yeah. at the moment and how precious time is. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll make this a really productive hour uh, of discussion. Um, but if you do need to leave for whatever reason, then the, the recording is there for you um, when we come back. Can I just stop you for a second, just to say that we need to introduce ourselves before we go any further. This is Jane and I'm Finn from Impact Wales, if you don't know us already. And we're going to be facilitating the session today. It's really our um, panel members who are going to be uh, talking in depth about the assessment uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I know Jane's got some housekeeping to get on with. Um, as we run through the session, if, you, if you've attended any of our previous ones, you know that um, as we go through, if you've got particular questions that you want to, to, uh, to raise or to follow up, um, we are using the question and answer but, uh, function, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you've got any particular things that you want to, or comments you want to make, you can use the chat, but we'd prefer if you could actually put questions in the question and answer session so all of our panel uh, can see them and respond to them. So that would be really useful. Um, but the structure really is the same as before, uh, which I know Finn is gonna go through, but I will monitor the chat. And if there are questions that are pertinent to, to the discussion going on at the, at the time, we'll pull those in and discuss those. Otherwise we'll come back to those um, as and when uh, we, we, we need to uh, throughout the session. Okay, so is there anything else? Um, the only other thing is if you want to tweet, our hashtag is hashtag Let's Talk Assessment. That'd be really useful. If there are things that you want to follow on Twitter, please do as well. Fantastic. Okay, so without further ado, I want to put up there at the front a huge thank you for our panellists who've made it today, who've uh, pushed their way through the, the crisis that is COVID out there to be with us and how important it is for us to have practitioners, senior leaders, teachers, classroom teachers, primary and secondary, uh, to talk about assessment today. It really does make a difference. And we fully appreciate that this, this is a little bit of a risk, putting your, uh, your, your thoughts out there um, for all of the uh, people listening. So we really appreciate what you're doing today and how important it is for us to have this discussion. So let me introduce the uh, panelists to you in uh, no particular order. We have Barry Mock, who is Welsh lead at Risker Comprehensive in South East Wales, and he's one of the people behind the 15 minute forum on Twitter, which is a fantastic for resource uh, for chat and discussion about curriculum for Wales. We also have uh, Kerry Richmond, deputy head teacher at Morriston Comprehensive in Swansea, who's a geography teacher. And again, somebody who's very interested in research informed practice. We have Andy Keegan, primary colleague from Pontlu Primary in Swansea. Uh, and somebody I know who's been a, a real interrogator of changes to education in Wales. And we have Adam Lopez uh, for the first time today, head teacher of Sagiston uh, CP School in Pembrokeshire, um, who I know is very interested in assessment as well. So thank you all for being here. Can I just say we might have a couple of other panel members do. dropping in. I, I know um, crisis things at school have, have occurred this afternoon, so they will possibly be joining us later if, if the time permits. Absolutely, and we'll introduce as we go along. Okay, so the reason that we've arranged these events um, is because we felt um, back in, um, I can't think about it now, probably March, May. wasn't it? No, it was March. Was it March? Yeah, March right, yeah. oh, sorry, earlier, much, much earlier this, this academic year or this, uh, sorry, this calendar year, that we needed to talk about assessment because nobody was really talking about it at the time. And I think there's actually been quite a lot more that's come out about assessment. So we've got even more to talk about because we need to have an open, honest discussion, not training necessarily. This is not training, but this is just about 
looking at and exploring what is out there, what isn't out there, what we know the answers to, what we don't know the answers to. So that may be one of the things that we highlight today is things that we as practitioners, as uh, people who support professional learning in school and as um, senior leaders actually don't understand uh, the, the answer to or aren't clear on what it actually means or how we're going to achieve it. So that's as important as actually answering questions. This is an exploration as much as anything. Now, the people on the panel here are just like you who are listening. They are teachers and leaders working in schools across Wales now. They're not, um, you know, special in any way, apart from the fact that oh, they they've joined, very, they they've joined us vegan. today. But they are just like you. They are. They have the experiences that you have. So please bear that in mind when you listen to them. Um, we're delighted not only to be joined by our, our panel, but also we have a, a film from Michael Childs, who has, if, if Jane can pass me uh, the book, which we um, we reviewed for uh, Michael uh, recently, uh, a fantastic book on assessment and pedagogy more uh, generally, The Sweet Spot, which has actually just come out recently, which is a really great read. Um, but he's uh, provided the assessment film today, which you're going to watch just to get that conversation going, get the conversation started. Okay, so without further ado, I think we'll start on today's session. And today's session is all about identifying, capturing and reflecting on individual learner progress over time. So that is the third of the three purposes of assessment as identified in Curriculum for Wales. So we're going to spend today talking about what that means how we might make, put it into practice in our schools and the, the issues surrounding that that um, have been highlighted by recent documents that have come out from Welsh Government. Um, before we do any of that, we are going to run a poll. OK, so you can this is an anonymous poll. Your answers will not be attributed to your name. But just before we start, we're going to put the poll up on the screen and then uh, you can uh, make your answers and we'll see how people feel about the answer to this question. So this one is all about tracking progress. So please put your answers on for the poll and we'll see how people feel. And we've got, oh, we've got one answer here, really outstripping the others. Uh, <laughs> be interesting, interesting yeah be interesting to guess which one it is guess which one this is okay so we're going to give people a chance to answer let's see and unfortunately had... our panel can't vote on this no one. you can't i mean if you wanted to tell us your own personal answer to this you could but that would be a bit mean so we'll keep this one anonymous for now and i think we've got we've got about 30 38 answers to this so far mm -hmm. at the people who are here oh yeah more yeah. than that okay OK, so we're we're still I don't think that one's going to change a great deal. Uh, so we're going to show you the answers to that one then. OK. Interesting. Un unexpected. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. either. I think we're, that was really quite yeah. expected that people are still. Um, oh, did I stop sharing that? Can you see that on your screen? I'll stop, just stop sharing that. There you go. OK, so right. What we're going to do is while I put set up the film, Jane is going to introduce the film a little bit for us. I think, well, we, we spoke to Michael oh, way back in the summer, didn't we? And I think, you know, there is that period of time from when Michael put the film together and from where we are today. But I think there's some really, um, you know, important bits to, to focus in on from the film today. And I think that's really where we've structured the questions for today's session. Okay, so ready? this is a film from Michael Childs. Hello all, uh, welcome to this short presentation for Impact Wales, looking at how we can reflect, identify and explore student progress over time. And part of this underpins our approach when we're looking at how we can craft uh, assessment for learning. So in this presentation, I'm gonna share a few ideas and some of the theory around how we can do that. And hopefully this is helpful when you are considering your approaches to assessment uh, as you move forward with the, the changes in your own context within your schools in Wales. Just a bit of an overview about myself. I'm currently a Trust Geography Lead in a school in the northwest of England and I've been teaching now for 13 years and uh, over that course of time 
I've used and reflected on my own experience of assessment to, to create two sort of books, which I'll share at the end if they're helpful and may explore some of the um, sort of theories and thoughts that I share in the presentation today. So when we're thinking about assessment, we're thinking about how we can craft assessment and some of these core principles that I talk about are condensing learning, reflecting on learning, how we get pupils um, to uh, demonstrate their progress, which is what we're focusing on in this session, uh, through uh, assessing their learning, uh, feeding forward, and then a target-driven improvement. So it's worth a bit of a sort of pit stop and reminder that when we are assessing pupils, we are ultimately trying to determine what they know and what they don't know. Now we know from our different uh, approaches to learning and the different theories and definitions, and David Dedale's one is, is really important to reflect on. He said that learning is the long-term retention of knowledge and the ability to transfer into new contexts. So when we're thinking about identifying pupils' gaps and looking at how we can maximize learner progress over time, we need to be mindful that actually learning is a change in long-term memory and the ability to transfer it to those new contexts. Therefore, what we see in lessons and what we see when we're capturing uh, learning is ultimately uh, determined by performance. And actually what they have learned is something that we don't, we don't see, but what we see is their performance in that assessment. And that's a short snapshot of what they know at that point in time and what they may not know and how we can help them to feed forward into the next stage to close some of those gaps. So Harry Fletcher Wood talks about the purpose of assessment when he wrote his book, um, and on responsive teaching, which is a really important piece of work, and I definitely recommend reading it. But he said that when assessment is formative, the aim is to reveal pupils' weaknesses so that the teacher can act on them, and that when assessment is summative, the aim is to give pupils a final grade, and so there can be uh, pressure to try and conceal and gloss over understanding. So if there's one sort of action that I'm going to recommend or talk about in this presentation is that there's a greater sort of uh, shift and emphasis when we uh, assess pupil learning that we're using greater uh, formative types of assessment over summative. And the idea that if we're using lots of summative, it can sort of suggest that the end of the learning uh, and that's finished, that stage, that journey that they were on is complete. When actually, as we've just said, if we want to truly assess the gaps and help to maximize progress, of learners over time, we know that that learning is that change in long-term memory. And then if we apply a more sort of um, regular summative approach to assessment, we could end up with sort of uh, impacts on the transfer and durability of uh, pupils' knowledge. So there's different types of assessment. There's the three key types of assessments that we know about. We know that there's assessment of learning, which is to demonstrate achievements and there is assessment as learning, so that self-regulate and that critical evaluation by the pupil, and then assessment for learning, which is to give feedback on learning and teaching. Now, what we're saying is that if we're going to look and identify gaps in a uh, pupil's knowledge um, to help sort of support closing those gaps, really important that we're focusing on that assessment for learning, where it's a lower stakes um, approach to assessment. And therefore, it underpicks the idea that greater emphasis on low stakes versus high stakes types of assessment is really important in reducing test anxiety and therefore enabling us to really capture a picture of what pupils do know and what they don't know. And that's really important to consider because we invest a lot of time as teachers in assessing learning. And is that assessment for learning that we're doing as teachers really capturing what they do know? if it's predominantly a high stakes approach to it, because we, as the more the higher the stakes, the research suggests the greater the anxiety that pupils find and associate with those assessments. And therefore there's a big sort of um, probability that their performance that we see may not truly reflect what they have learned. And therefore what we're capturing is actually um, not really valuable information as, as teachers. So we want to apply a more sort of low stakes approach to that. 
And this, this idea of reducing the test anxiety by what I'm calling is getting pupils to work towards their personal best. We want them to work towards their personal best rather than that, having that competition around them. And there's a couple of ways we can do that. And then when we're doing assessments, we're not doing it where we're ranking or, or having a league table. Um, and one of those is to not give out any scores or any percentages or any grades to pupils. We know also from the work of Dylan Williams that when we're looking at the gaps that pupils have, we don't need to be saying to people, you, you've scored 60% on this assessment or you've scored seven out of 10. It can be a big distractor. And then it becomes more about their performance in relation to their peers rather than their personal best. And we want them to aim towards their personal best. And that personal best is focusing on them understanding, for example, a particular um, aspect of the subject that they're studying or to um, demonstrate the ability to apply it in different contexts rather than the grade, the percentage or the marks out a certain um, number of questions. So we reflect on traditional assessment design and sort of capturing what pupils know. Uh, historically, it was about isolated um, information uh, based on an end of topic test. So, for example, being a geographer, this is this is um, a sort of an idea of what it used to look like, uh, where you teach at tectonics and then test at the end, teach coastal landscapes, test at the end, very isolated, summative, high stakes assessments or end topics assessments. What I'm suggesting, if we're going to really sort of capture um, so true, rich knowledge of what people know and what they need to do to move forward, we have a combination of interim low state quizzing using the uh, retrieval practice, which we know is not a form of assessment, but a learning strategy to encourage bringing information back to mind, using silent and stained milestones through um, sort of uh, individual application tasks and then formative classroom strategies through those formative types of assessment approaches. And that leads us into this idea of a cumulative ass uh, assessment design, where one assessment builds on the other and it enables knowledge to be transferred into different contexts between different learning cycles. And I'm suggesting a learning cycle approach throughout the academic year. And within that learning cycle, we have a series of application tasks based on the subject where pupils are demonstrating how they can apply their knowledge and low state quizzing, and then a cumulative assessment. Now the cumulative assessment building on knowledge from one learning cycle to another. What does that look like? So when we're thinking about this idea of uh, Herman Ebenhaus's curve, the forgetting curve, we know that he and his study and subsequent studies, um, Rodiger and Karpik, to name one but a few, demonstrated that the when we are exposed to something, our recall will decline rapidly over the first 30 days after we've learned a new concept or piece of information. So if we build in a cumulative approach to assessment design, then that's helping to bring that information constantly back to mind between different learning cycles as they move through their subject. And we know this is the example, the more we improve, the more we review, the greater the retention of knowledge. How does it look like? Here's an example of history. Uh, and so over time, they might be looking at different elements of World War I. And so the first assessment might look at the legacy of World War I, the Weimar constitution, the opposition to Weimar. And then the next assessment will build in that knowledge, but will also look at the revolts against Weimar and problems of 1923. And the next one will build on that. The important part of this cumulative assessment design is it's purely about knowledge recall. So in the learning cycle, this knowledge recall is about what don't they know or what do they know about the particular subject. The, uh, the silent same milestones are their ability to apply it. So this is knowledge recall in these assessments. And this is where there's a key focus. If we want to truly know, truly know what the gaps are for our so pupils, we really need to focus on knowledge um, recall and separate that from application of knowledge. 
So that might be to explain something in our subjects, to assess, to evaluate, to examine, uh, and so forth. They would come in our silent sustained milestones. And why do we think learning, well, why do, why do I believe that learning progressions are important? Because as Popham said in his study in 2008, a carefully sequenced set of building blocks that students must master en route to a more distinct curriculum aim are really important. The building blocks consist of sub-skills and bodies of enabling knowledge. Each one of those cumulative assessments through the learning cycle build in those carefully sequenced building blocks. So what did it look like? So learning cycle one in September, for example, they will learn that sort of core content in that learning cycle. They'll have um, sort of 60% uh, in that learning cycle of the knowledge in that assessment. They'll have prior knowledge around about 30% weighting uh, and any gaps in previous knowledge. And then they'll have uh, current sort of learning cycle vocab. So focus on the vocabulary as well. And then that will feed then into learning cycle two. And over time, what does the learning cycles look like? So we have core teaching weeks with inter sort of leave retrieval practice, cumulative assessment week, a gap week to close any gaps, a review of those knowledge gaps, and then planned retrieval of gaps into next learning cycle through the use of uh, those um, interim low state quizzes and the silent sustained milestones. Why are we doing it? Well, we know that feedback is an important part. If we want to share and communicate those gaps with pupils, then that's really important to enable them to feed forward into the next learning cycle to help achieve those learning goals. So how can we do that? So a few examples here. So we've got some learning and curriculum checkpoints. Um, so we're sharing the bigger picture of where they are on the journey and what it is that they, they should know at the end of it. You again, we've got the knowledge checklist, again, really important. Checking the knowledge, prior knowledge at the start of the learning cycle, what is it they currently know or think they know, and then where does that fit at the end of the learning cycle using uh, the, uh, the outcomes from the assessment, focusing on what did they get right, what did they get wrong, not how many they got right or how many they got wrong. And then using our sort of um, science study milestones to really focus on the core sort of application of knowledge. You can see here some examples of other knowledge review sheets and also a core focus on um, using whole class feedback in those application tasks. There's just a few ideas there that I've shared in terms of how we can really focus on identifying gaps in knowledge with our pupils and looking at how we can um, close those on gaps and ensure progress over time. So if you want to read a bit more about uh, some of the work that I've done, uh, there's the craft of assessment, which focuses on that approach, overall or overarching approach, to the principles of assessment for learning, and then the feedback pendulum more recently, which focuses on how we can really sort of hone in on feedback to help support uh, pupils in moving forward in their learning. I hope it was helpful and if you've got any questions please um, follow me on Twitter which is uh, my handle is at m underscore Charles. It was at the start of the presentation if you want to carry on the conversation or ask any further questions about feedback um, and in particular using assessment to close knowledge gaps be more than happy to carry on that conversation. Um, I hope you have a good day and um, speak to you soon. That was great. A very interesting summary of some of the key principles of assessment generally. And I think um, one of the first things that Michael uh, that Mike mentioned was learning. And obviously assessment is all about assessing learning. But do you think, panel, throwing out this question to you now, do you think it's important that we need to define what learning is before we can actually talk about assessing it? Anybody like to? volunteer that one. Barry and Adam, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's first thing that strikes me though, before I answer that question is that assessment is so complex. And if we're talking about curriculum design as being complex, and uh, particularly listening to your podcast the other day with Dr. Kev, 
and the, the, the nuances that go into that, surely the same nuances exist within the field of assessment. So it's not, it's not something that you're going to find one thing that satisfies everything. Um, absolutely, we have to define what learning is before we can really talk about assessment, because um, I think it's Dylan Willem says, says this, is that assessment is the link uh, between what is taught and what is learned. And that's how they communicate with each other. And, you know, without having a, a serious definition of what we mean by learning, we're not even talking a common theme um, because that learning could, I mean, I, it probably does look very different to different subjects. Um, so therefore, you'd probably have to break it down, you know, for each of the AOLEs at least. Um, and I don't feel that um, what we have in the uh, statements, you know, in terms of the what matters really helps um, to frame what that learning looks like, in, in my own personal opinion. And, and this is it. Thank you, Barry. I think what we're talking about here is having learning objectives, isn't it? So that we've got yeah. a really clear goal that we're heading towards and how well are pupils heading towards that goal. Um, Adam, would hey, you like to add something? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. So I don't, know, I don't think any of you will ever finally settle on a, you know, a definition that satisfies everybody. Um, with with regards to learning, um, you know, my, from my from my perspective, you know, you can think of it from a phys from a physiological point of view. It's sort of the uh, development of the architecture of the brain um, that's been done through the processing of the uh, senses and the information that comes into the senses, and of course that starts very early on as soon as the nervous system begins. Um, and I'm a big fan of, of Dido or David Dido, but but you know he's very focused on knowledge. You know he really um, even sees skills as procedural knowledge. Um, whilst you know I'm looking through things now through the uh, you know uh, the, the curriculum for Wales lens, um, and I think that a better way to describe that is information instead of knowledge. I think you can. You know, to become a healthy individual, for example, it isn't just decision making, it's also um, behavior. Um, to be eth ethical or to be confident and all these things, it it's a little bit more complex um, as a, 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 than, than just simply the acquisition of pieces of knowledge into schema, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, that, I think that uh, we need to have a, a very broad understanding of what it is if we're going to be uh, in line with the vision for the curriculum for Wales. Um, it's, since that the curriculum for Wales arrived, I've had to adjust my thinking on it and try and make it broader because I think that what we've got to try and do from an assessment point of view is um, uh, collect information uh, on, on the learners in a holistic sense, as broad as possible, and that will take uh, uh, you know, different approaches and a, a different paradigm to, to operate from, yeah. Absolutely, and I think that the one of the things that is clear in Curriculum for Wales is that assessment is all about how well learners are getting to those four purposes, becoming confident, competent individuals, and sometimes it will be knowing what website they can go to to keep themselves safe, so really clear facts, information, but sometimes it will be about how to behave in a certain situation or what skill to use in a certain situation. So yes, I mean, Michael does talk a lot about knowledge gaps. Do you think that progress is about um, that uh, closing those knowledge gaps? I can, I can come back in and if you want on that. Adam, I'll come back to you in a second. We yeah, just had were. Andy waved his hand at me. So Andy, what do you think, knowledge gaps? I. Uh, I made a note on this one because I'm going to jump in on what Adam was saying because I like the fact that he talked about it's not just about le learning is just about knowing stuff mm -hmm. um, and I, I came across a really great phrase a little while back because I was getting really frustrated with um, children in my class um, not using full stops and capital letters but when you ask them they know that they have to use full stops and capital letters it's just they don't and they have this this thing called a knowing doing um, issue where they know they have to do it but it's not an automatic thing because it's not part of their kind of everyday thing and the difficulty with knowledge gaps is everybody's going to have knowledge gaps in very very different places and if you think right back to the very start of schools take reception children for example some of their the things that, that they do and they, they learn about isn't about getting it into a buck they learn things like how to walk into school without walking into each other and how to put their coats on and things like that and that, that goes a lot deeper than just knowing about stuff. It's also about the, the whole person. And when you come back to the, the four purposes and what you want everyone to be 
when they leave their education journey in, at the age of 16 or 25, I think it ain't for now in the, in the, the cricket of Wales, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, or the ALN, um, getting the two mixed up a little bit. It's not just about knowing stuff and finding what those gaps are, because sometimes you might not be able to spot th those, those things are missing as easily through just checklists. Um, and you know, particularly look at the health and well-being being such a massive part now, uh, being its own AOLE. And um, there are a lot of really subtle things in there that are going to be difficult to, to, to identify without through just using a checklist at the start of a session, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Is there anything anybody else wants to add on this idea of um, learning and progress being about closing gaps? Kerry? You're on mute, Kerry. <laughs> Every time. It comes back again, doesn't it? So that, that, that idea of progress and, and, and how you identify what that means in certain peoples. And I think that th this is where I'm at at the moment in terms of how you, how, uh, where's a whole school that we're trying to look at, where's our teaching end, where does assessment start, you know, and we, we're trying to sort of make sure that it's interwoven in our teaching and learning and our pedagogy as well but that progression needs to be specific and this is where I, I I'm falling down here because each subject area has such complex skills and we need to break down those complex skills into very very small parts in order obviously not to overwhelm our long-term uh, working memory for example and that is going to look very, very different in certain subject areas and specific subject areas. It's also going to look really different in certain topics within certain subject areas. It could even look different in the capability and the academic level of the class you have in front of you. So when we're talking about tracking and monitoring or even identifying progress, to have that assessment framework sort of, you know, come from above or, or have a national framework, if that's the way we go in, that's not going to work. It's going to have to be teacher-led. Teachers are going to have to be able to make the decisions about what tasks are most likely to lead to the attainment of the pupils sitting in front of them, of where they're at now, what they need to do to improve, and how they're going to get there. And that nuance is on a daily, lesson-by-lesson -lesson basis. I think a really good analogy that, that you know, I come up with is the sport analogy. It's a really quick one, right? A rugby match. And we're talking about... The performance is the summative match at the end of it where you've got a, we've got a scoreline. But that has no bearing on training and the drills that you do every single training session in order to build up your skill sets to be able to perform at that level. Those drilling, that formative feedback that we give the children is so subject specific and so topic specific. I don't see how, where on earth do we start doing that and identifying and tracking and monitoring that? It has to be a teacher base. Well, something that, that you mentioned that I think we could come back to with what Barry said was that assessment is incredibly complex and actually very common sense approach that if we are thinking about um, how are we going to assess, we need to know what it is we're actually aiming for and what are the little bits, like you were saying, along that journey in order to be able to, um, to identify whether progress has been made, have all of the steps been really fully understood along that journey to that, that end goal. And you were talking about there, um, having this uh, real understanding of um, a model of progression, but that model of progression is actually, what you were saying there, your curriculum. So do you think that, um, panel, what's your view on um, where that, that model of progression comes from, where do you find those steps along the way? Because we have, I'm throwing a question now, I haven't put on the, the list for everybody, and they're all looking a little bit worried now, but we've got this curriculum framework, which has the descriptions of learning, uh, but those are three years apart. And for some pupils, it might even be five years apart, depending on how quickly they progress. So where are we going to get that little nitty gritty idea of what progression looks like. Anybody like to give that one a go? Kerry? My thinking starts with the why, and it has to come back to each department and each AOLE of what is your vision of what makes an expert geographer, historian, mathematician, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, and starting with of, of, of where they want to go. Right. So it is it's certainly in secondary, it's subject specific. Certainly a, as an English teacher, I would be very much thinking about um, the steps along the way to making sure that um, full stops were um, automatic for pupils. Andy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think there is definitely going to be a, a different approach from secondary to primary, possibly. Um, and that also is possibly going to be influenced by, um, talking from a primary perspective, it's going to be influenced by the school that you feed and what they want their progression, where, where say where they want their year sevens to be joining um, based mm -hmm. on, you know, all the things that Kerry talked about that the, are the, the differences which make teaching great where every school is different and every pupil has different experiences and even in different parts of Wales you're going to have very different experiences because of the locality and the, and the expertise they have and um, so in terms of trying to figure out what those little steps are that needs that does need to kind of come from collaborative working not just you, you can't sit yourself in a bubble and just say this is what we're going to do you have to work with your cluster and you have to work with your feeder schools to so that you you given everybody the opportunity to arrive and start at the same points um and to, to try and avoid those knowledge gaps as, as was talked about in the in the video before you even start in your curriculum um and and it will look different between between secondary and primary because obviously where where the secondaries want them to start is kind of somewhere roughly that you're going to be aiming for from primary i think so if I just kind of paraphrase some of the things just to make sure that um, I've understood and maybe uh, listeners have understood as well, you're saying that the, the progress nitty gritty that is in between those descriptions of learning is actually coming from the teachers, it's coming from discussion between the teachers, it's coming from what your curriculum looks like in your school and how that compares with where it might be as you go into a, a secondary school. Uh, I don't know if I've set you up to answer what you wanted to say, Adam, but um, do you want to... That, that's, that's, pre that's pretty much the, the, the probably the easier way of explaining what I tried to say. Uh, Thank you. Thank <laughs> after, you, Andy. After, after a long couple of weeks. But yeah, I think at the moment, because we don't have that very specific kind of micro or even macro um, progression steps of individual yeah. skills, when we have such broad three-year things yeah. that at the moment, as schools, um, we have to be working with with the, the pupils of the children that are in front of us um, and that will look very very different in in my school to a school even just down the road and um, because the the experiences and uh, of everybody are going to be different um yeah. teachers and, and pupils the expertise yeah. of you as a teacher as well absolutely adam yeah. did you want to add something to that yeah sure i think that something that's really important is to understand that this curriculum's coming from a different direction to where we've been previously there's you know we're all we're used to following pathways and ladders and sort of sort of fairly sort of um well laid out routes of learning beforehand so people have mapped out curriculums before even teaching anything you know mm. uh, we're not in that position anymore you know the reality is that i from what my understanding is this curriculum is built upon formative assessment and dynamic responsive teaching and it is and it means that people have to sort of you know create as they go uh, and 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 the curriculum is not easily developed beforehand. It has to be done with the, the the learners in mind. So, with regards to assessment for learning, you know, it's about it's about the the teacher's ability to elicit the information required to inform their next their next decision making, like in real time. Um, so, the planning that happens next week should really be influenced by what's just happened today. And uh, I think and, I, I just sorry, I want to pause you because I think that's such an important point. It, were, it bears saying again, is eliciting um, information about learning so that you know what's needed next, isn't it? And so it is immensely challenging and immensely complex. And, and it's really down to pedagogy, this instead of curriculum. But the two things are incredibly closely related. But what, what's required is, is the teachers need to personalize the learning experience of every single learner to the best as much as they can. I know that sounds very challenging. You know, um, but that, that means really getting to understand the learner in a holistic sense there, you know, and collecting, having the ability to collect a wide breadth of information about that learner and not just their academic progress in, in, in a fairly narrow uh, domain or, or, you know, ladder. 
Um, it, it's really, really important that formative assessment is at the heart of, 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 um, of classroom practice um, and, you know, activating the learners themselves so they can know where they're going in the learning, what, the, what their successes are, where they go next, making sure there are personalised targets, making sure that, you know, Things such as learning conferences where, where, where teachers can have one-to-one -one time with their learners and, uh, and um, activating peers um, and not just in the tick box sense, uh, you know, just like throw away activities, but in a meaningful way. And that takes time. It takes coaching. Um, you know, there is there is an awful lot to do. And I think that just just kind of before I bring Barry in on this, because I know he's got his hand raised there is. Um, one of the things that I think we are identifying through this open and honest discussion is that this is not something that as teachers even that we can say, yep, yeah, it's a job done or yep, yeah, we can do this over the next couple of years or yep, yeah, you know, this is this can all be sorted before we have our curriculum ready for September 2022. This is a huge, ongoing, um, very complex uh, job. And I think it shouldn't be underestimated how much we need to be focusing in on this in order to really get it right and it, you know there is a question over the, whether we've got quite enough time to do that uh barry is there anything else that you want to add to that um yeah there were, there were two things but they're only short so you'd be grateful that i'm not going to go on for ages um first of all if i go back to the video uh, mr child says right carefully sequenced set of building blocks yeah. now whilst i appreciate we you know and i take take on board everything that's said we don't want the tick boxes we don't want the no in my head i have a curriculum how the kid gets from where they are to where they're going to need to be for gcse mm. that is a carefully sequenced set of building blocks that i've been developing over the last 25 years as a teacher and this is the second point that i wanted to say is that all of this is pointless without some serious professional development for the teachers in the schools if you want to talk assessments yes i can knock up a test for the kids right to do this reading comprehension and i'm going to make judgments on whether this child has learned this stuff or not um you know is that a really good assessment is it giving me the data that i want it is it valid is as is it is it ethical um is it fair um there are so many questions and so many things that as a teacher and it's great that the curriculum is challenging me now to think about this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to um, be negative about it. But, you know, what are we assessing? If I want to look at the progress of this child, are you really telling me that after 25 years as a teacher of Welsh in a school that I don't know what that progress looks like? The problem comes is, oh, but Mr. Mock, you have to prove that to us because we're not going to take your word for it. And that's where the problem really lies. It, you know, so... For me, those carefully sequenced set of building blocks are there amongst the professional discussions within that development, what you're putting in the curriculum for your area. Those plot blocks will be established. Now, hopefully those blocks will be fitting or at least able to be matched to the, the what matters statements in some ways. How I'm going to assess, you know, the child's increasing love of literature, I don't know, but that's another matter. Um, you know, and then when we come to assess that, right, we have to be very, very careful and meticulous about what type of assessments they are. Is it telling me what I what I want it to tell me? Because and that I'll have to do three or four different assessments to get that whole picture. But I haven't at this point, after 25 years, got the expertise that I need to be able to do that well. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that for me is, is, is a massive issue. And I, I think that's something that probably the reason that we've got these let talk assessment events is that people are concerned about whether they know exactly how to do this. And I think, you know, we don't all know exactly how to do this and what it's going to look like. And something that just strikes me, Barry, you know, with your 25 years experience is that your 25 years experience is going to look different to somebody else's 25 years experience. And we are all doing this at the same time in every school across Wales, sometimes in discussion with other people, but sometimes not very much discussion with other people. So we're all doing it at the same time. Um, and how are we going to fit all of that together? So I just wanted to ask a question. We are, we are getting um, along in time here. Something that has uh, come out recently um, was the uh, subordinate legislation for the uh, 
uh, assessment uh, of curriculum for Wales, uh, the consultation on that document. And one of the things that I think a lot of schools are bothered about is um, how Welsh Government are going to expect you to capture if there is going to be any expectation from Welsh, Welsh Government, but this purpose talks about capturing assessment. And um, what do you understand by the term capturing progress, sorry, capturing progress? Adam. Well, I think, it, I think we need to think about what we can capture and what we can't and how we do it. So I think that, you know, the way I'm viewing this is it's like coming to a research project and thinking what methodology do I use? What, what the appropriate tools, what's the appropriate paradigm for this? And I feel like a case study methodology is probably the most appropriate because you need to use a, blend, a blended approach to capture sort of quantitative and qualitative information on each individual learner so that you can then basically assimilate, collate it, assimilate it, and then come to sort of substantiated conclusions on, on progress. I think that, um, there are tools that are going to be available. For example, the um, you know ass national assessments. Um, they have provide a standardised score uh, twice a year. Um, they're going to be provide figures essentially, which um, it will give us an idea of how children are progressing relative to their peers um, nationally. Um, and there are also other sort of companies that can provide adaptive um, assessments, so that we can have something that's not just subjective, because. The risk is, we, if we just go down purely assessment, you know, uh, the, the route where the teacher is the person who makes the whole decision on it, you know, we, it's hard to um, standardize or, monitor or um, calibrate that, as we've discovered in the past, <laughs> with monitoring, you know, uh, different activities we've done as clusters. Um, so what we need is a blended approach where we are collecting uh, the information in the broadest sense so that we can sort of triangulate and come to sort of fairly sound conclusions over progress in all the different domains. Um, Sorry, can I just interrupt you there for a second just to talk about, because something you've raised there has just reminded me that um, there's this idea of a shared understanding of progression. It was what you mentioned about getting a national standard and having a, a, an ability to compare what somebody who is making excellent progress in um, English and in literacy in a primary school looks like in Penarth and what that looks like in um, Clandidno and uh, how those two can actually be compared. This national um, standard or this comparative tool, this shared understanding of progression, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there, there's some conflicting information, I think, out there in the guidance um, and the various consultation documents around this, to be honest. So there is like there's a other, there's subsidiarity seems to sit at the heart of this curriculum where basically subsidiarity where, being uh, um, teachers having control where, where there's ownership of the teacher uh, to basically create the curriculum in the, you know, it, it, that's context specific, um, which is great. You know, that sounds that's fine. But it's but there's also a push towards. Um, schools having the sort of consistent approach well, across a cluster um, that I've read in, the, in some of the consultation documents, which sort of insinuates that there needs to be some alignment. Um, but of course, assessment can only be coming, can only be aligned if content and curriculum is aligned. So now that leads me to sort of go down that rabbit hole and I start thinking about how is that possible? So either the, the, the teachers get, a, get together ahead of the actual planning process and map it out, which is how, how it used to be. Um, but I don't think that's what's intended with this new curriculum. I think it's meant to be more dynamic and more more, more adaptive. Um, or they work in men, you know, very closely day by day, you know, digitally and try and come up with something that's aligned. But then how can that be? How, that's not subsidiarity in its truest sense, is it? It's kind of a... That's, so that's, if, uh, totally so if we're talking about clusters being aligned across clusters and having a shared understanding of progression and progression mm. being linked with the curriculum model, has anybody got any other ideas about how we might get a shared understanding of progression or their thoughts on what a shared understanding of progression actually means? Can I, can I just add into that as well? There is. I was beginning to panic because there oh, were right. no questions, but we have actually got three now. Um, there's two from Chris Lee, and I'll come back to Kevin's as well. After Christy's just said, does anyone know how the government expects us to get consistency between schools? And I think it's the same point, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. So what does progress look like in one school yeah. A and school B? Has anybody any ideas as to how that consistency, that national comparison is going to happen? And please, if you don't have an answer, <laughs> just shake your head. Kerry and Andy. So Kerry first. Yeah, I'm going to put, 
put my head in a block beer a little bit, I think. You know, the, the whole of the curriculum for Wales is shifting the focus on a, a formative assessment driven curriculum. Responsive teaching based on what the teacher sees, as Adam says, eliciting information of what the children are doing now and informing my next steps in teaching. Now, we all know that, you know, in theory, assessment for learning is fantastic. Of course, if you find out exactly where a child is at, you know exactly where they need to go and how they need to get there. You communicate that to the child and work with them to be. It's a beautiful system, but it's always been that way. Assessment for learning has always been that way. So why has it never worked before? And I think, you know, the reason it's never worked before, and the reason it's been, it's even Dylan Williams himself has said, you know, the reason it is because the pressure that has been placed upon it from the external systems. You know, when, when Eston tell you, I want to know how you are using your internal people itemized data, then therefore we are going to use it to judge you. And therefore there's a great deal of pressure on those data sets. And I'm just afraid this is going to be the same system or end up be the same system repackaged in a different way. At the moment, I can't see how we disentangle it. And I, I think that we would uh, come to you in a, a second, Angela, that we would second that is we have spent literally days looking at the assessment legislation and we can't make sense of these two competing, conflicting um uh, principles that actually seem to be pulling away from each other. Andy, uh, did you want to mention something? Um, yeah, I'm going to be quite facetious and just say that if you want, if you want a national shared understanding of progression, then why hasn't it just been set out in the first place? Realistically, yeah, that, that's. I don't think that's facetious. That's just very clear. Um, because unfortunately, you you are going to get some schools who put together a really um, uh, forward-thinking, very, very um, demanding curriculum, saying that you need to do this, 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 they put loads and loads of sub-steps in, and some schools will strip it right back and go, well, actually, we think that progression is only should only look like this between for these children mm. of these particular ages. And without those discussions between your clusters and actually wider, you know, your consortia really need to be um working top down realistically and driving those com uh, those conversations as well um i don't know whether that happens across wales um, i'm not going to start having a conversation about consortia because we haven't got time for it but you can't every school is going to have their own idea of what progression is going to look like and it's going to be very very difficult to have a shared idea of what progress so we're back to the we're back to the paradox of different and the same. Can we yeah. have a Schrodinger's cat of, you know, different and the same operating in the, at the same moment in the same context with the same, uh, yeah. yeah. And I think, I think it does come down, just to jump in again, it does come down to, um, we still don't know as well, and it hasn't been part of the conversation yet, but we still don't know what, for example, Eston are going to be looking for when they start rolling out their inspections again of, of the curriculum for Wales. Because if, we, if we're going to be judged on progress, and they are setting their own standards of what they think progress should be looking at, but why aren't Eston just telling us what progress should be? Just, just a quick aside, sorry, Barry and Adam, and I will come to you. Um, Eston have published their... Um, their uh, what do they call it what inspectors will inspect and we picked out a, a phrase in there and it talks about um, experiences um, that are uh, appropriate for a pupil's age so if you want to know more about that that is worth going and having a look at that Barry um, okay I'd just like to flip this a little bit and sort of really give you the scope of the challenge that is in front of us all okay if you went into every school in Wales today and asked each teacher to give you a definition of what formative assessment meant, I dread to think how many different answers you would get. So if we are talking about a shared understanding of what assessment is, I wonder if we went into every school and asked what is assessment, whether we'd get the same variety of answers. So in answer to your question, 
It is upskilling the teachers. If you want a shared understanding of what assessment looks like, then let's have a national discussion about what that is and thrash it out so that we all have a working definition of what that is and what it's supposed to look like. I totally agree that within context, we may need to refine that back and adjust it for our own locations, but let's have a clear vision of what that is meant to be. Um, and so, you know, again, professional development. You know, I'm clusters, sensing, work, clusters working together. Where's the time? Where's the money? I, I'm no? sensing a little bit of frustration from you, Barry. Sorry, I think it's sorry. no, no, no. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good <laughs> reflection of where a lot of teachers are. The frustration that they want more information because we all want to do the right thing, and I think it is frustrating when we don't feel maybe we haven't got quite enough to be able to do the right thing. Adam, do you want to add something? And then we're going to have to think about uh, where we go next with this I've panel discussion. I've got a discussion. couple of questions to come okay. back to as okay. well. Okay, so though. Adam and then a couple of questions. Yeah, it, it, it's, um, what, I'm, what I'm conscious of is that the, the, gov the government with their well-intended vision have, have created a vacuum, really. And, and, and the vacuum is what happens underneath the descriptions of learning for three years, you know. And, and of course, teachers naturally um, want to know that they're doing the right thing. Um, not all are experts in health, fitness and well-being or humanities and uh, science and technology. So they, they, they will say that a lot of teachers um, would, uh, would appreciate it if there was more granular information available. But I understand why there isn't, because they're trying to incentivize a different approach. Fine. But there, but there are some red flags and there are some concerns. And while the things I do worry about is that when you create a vacuum that's usually filled by something or somebody. So there's a lot of consultants that have huge influence now. Um, and their, their vision, their interpretation is very powerful and uh, is getting adopted in many areas, rightly or wrongly. Um, and also there are many, you know, some certain platforms now that are used for, tra for tracking the design of planning and assessing that are becoming immensely popular and they, their popularity is growing very quickly because they offer a panacea, which is what a lot of schools are after. And there's, there's also a, a strength in numbers sort of security around the use of them. And uh, a lot of these planning tools, they, you know, they, 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 you know, there are even ones that provide sort of exemplar, you know, um, Granny, they provide information that could sit below the descriptions of learning, which is what some many many schools want. But it's it's an exemplar basically. But if en if enough people are using it, the likelihood is most schools are not going to spend a massive amount of time deviating dramatically from it because um, it provides the teachers something to work with in that first instance. But it also can solve that problem that you're talking about in terms of consistency around a cluster. Or, na or nationally. So we could end up in a very odd situation where the reluctance to give more information means that private companies uh, provide those solutions, large numbers adopt them, and we end up with consistency uh, or a, a curriculum that was, that's, that's largely driven by the uh, you know, private sector <laughs> solutions. You know? And I can understand why uh, they would become popular. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I think that, ju just to say that we don't provide that kind of stuff, but just to say when we're talking about private companies, but the the idea that uh, we have got a, a fantastic opportunity to write a curriculum, to assess that curriculum, to measure the progress of pupils against that curriculum. But if we also have the constraint of time and accountability pressing on that and COVID, that we're in a situation where even though we want to do the right thing, that it may be almost impossible to do the right thing if you've got somebody over there offering you a solution that seems a very very easy way of doing it and if lots of other people are also using that solution it becomes incredibly attractive should we go to a couple of questions um, just to go back to uh, i think it's one from kevin and one from leanne which sort of address the same the same issue kevin said what's the panel's view of assessment as opposed to testing when the Welsh Government doc documents refer to assessment indistinguishable from learning. That's the one part. And Leanne Samuels has said, how do the reading procedure and reasoning maths personalised assessments fit into the mythology of Crickland for Wales? Okay, so, so should, should, we, should we just ask that uh, question about um, assessment as indistinguishable from teaching and learning? What's your understanding of that? Because that's a, a phrase that Welsh Government uh, mentioned uh, a lot. No, and I'm going to have to, yeah, we're going to have to Keep answers short, please, because we're, we're kind of short in time. And Kerry, I'll come to you after Adam. Adam. 
yeah, it's just going back to formative assessment. That's, that's effectively what that is. It's real time sort of um, adaptive teaching, responsive teaching, using a full, you know, spectrum of, of, of strategies to elicit that key information. Um, and uh, you know, with ref reference to the to the um, national assessments, you know, again, they they, they can form part of a blended uh, approach to to assessing. Um, that's used in conjunction with other um, qualitative forms of uh, assessment uh, and judgments then are derived from the combination of all that information. Thank you, Adam. Said very succinctly, brilliant. Kerry? I completely agree with everything Adam just said. Um, <laughs> what I'm a little concerned about now is where I've just read the, um, the legislative expectations from Welsh Government about, well, how then, if that's legislation, but you're telling us it's intrinsic into our teaching, are you then legislating how we teach? And yeah. it comes back to them subsidiarity again. Okay, very good point there. So if assessment is indistinguishable from teaching and assessment and the, uh, teaching and learning and they are legislating for assessment, good point, are they legislating for what's going on in the classroom? We've got another question. Uh, it's just for Christy again to go back to something that Barry said a little bit earlier. Um, she said, I agree on the expertise that Barry was saying, but also what about the teachers who are starting out that have no experience? I think when you were talking, Barry, yeah. you knew about your you know, the number of years you experience you've had, you know what you're, you're doing. What about our teachers that, you know, are just starting in the profession? Right, okay, I'm going to uh, run a poll now because we have a poll that is all about the shared understanding of progress. So now that we've had uh, a, a big discussion of that, uh, let's have a think about um, uh, what people understand by that. So I'm gonna launch this poll and we'll have a quick poll. So please do answer uh, the poll here and we'll see if there's a, a clear winner as we come through. So this shared understanding of progress, what does it actually mean in practice now that we've had that discussion? Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. We've got uh, two, two answers that are competing. One is a little bit uh, bigger than the other. Okay. So we're, we're getting uh, lots of answers in here now. I'm just trying to see if we're going to change any further. Right, I'm going to show you the answer because we want to. So if you haven't voted already, quickly vote and I will show the answer. OK, so let's let's see what people thought. OK, so hoping today our discussion today and panelists, your your views and uh, opinions here have been uh, helpful in helping you to the start today. Can we? Yeah, <laughs> we should have done this. We see the difference between the beginning and the end, but I'm sure that we were um it, it, the discussion actually has helped i also want to uh, just run one at the end we haven't really discussed this but i think it'd be really interesting to see people's thoughts on the descriptions of learning so have a look at this final poll before we finish off today um so answer the poll now it's quite a detailed one this so i'll just give you a moment to have a look at it Okay, I think people are taking a moment to just read those answers because some of those answers are quite detailed. Okay, it's a real mix, mm. real mix of answers for this one. Just goes to show that uh, if we're looking for consistency across uh, Wales, uh, we're certainly not we consistent on, on people's approaches to developing uh, the curriculum for Wales or even how far they got in that process. Okay, so another few seconds here. Okay, I'm gonna share this poll now. Okay, so there's a real mix in there, but I think the biggest one there is uh, not having decided what to do with the descriptions of learning yet, which is interesting, isn't it? Okay, right then, oh, we have covered an enormous amount. Is there anything else that we want to mention before we- We have no more questions unless anybody would particularly like to pop one in the chat. Um, and if we haven't got the time, we can go back and uh, with the panel, we can answer that after the session's finished. Okay. At the moment, we have we've been very quiet with questions today. I think it's a sign of how tired everybody is. Yeah. Okay. So we, Adam, just a very quick uh, thing to uh, comment to finish. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, so regarding the, the descriptions of learning, the, the, the top the top one there, you know, I've been reading the guidance a lot, and it's really quite clear that they don't want the descriptions of learning to be used as like a lesson objective or as an assessment criteria. Um, 
you know, I think that causes people problems because they're, 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 they're first person I am capable statements, which historically have always been used for self-assessment. So they're very confusing. But, for, you know, the government seems to be suggesting that they're not to be used to be assessed against and they're not to be used in terms of what a lesson's content is. You know, there's more needs to go on below them, um, which poses a lot of problems, perhaps for another day. OK, and, and I think it's not the government seems to be saying this. They are quite clearly saying thank you very much for raising this, Adam, that you should not assess directly against the descriptions of learning. And they're quite clear in saying that in their uh, guidance. They're also clear to say that schools, they are, do not expect schools to break the descriptions of learning down into sub steps that the school uses to assess directly against. So just those two points. Uh, of order that we've um, we've picked up. Jane, do you want to uh, to round up our incredibly interesting I, session? Because I've been able to sit and listen quite quite a lot more today than I have in in previous sessions because we haven't had as many questions. Although I can just see two have just just popped in, um, but there were two two phrases that or two sentences that I thought really hit hit home as we went through. I think they were I think they might have both been from you, Adam. Apologies if they were from somebody else as well. Um, it's not just about knowing stuff and identifying knowledge gaps. I think that's really important, that it's it's a lot wider, a lot broader than that. Um, but also the assessment is about this eliciting information about learning so that you know what to teach next. And I think if we boil it right down to that, that's what assessment, really good assessment is, isn't it? It's about in the moment, what our pupils can do and how we can help them move on. But I think the, the challenge of today really has been, we've gone, gone really full circle and we're right back to this, this discussion over you know what does progress actually mean i don't think we've really no. got an answer to that and well, it's you know can i just say yeah, we don't, don't have know. a shared understanding of progression we don't you know and how we're going to measure it we still we're still unsure and i think that's the conversation yeah. that you and i have had for a long yeah. time now is we keep going round and round in circles but hopefully at some point we'll be able to break that circle so it just leaves me to say thank you so much to our uh, kind brave and thoughtful uh, panelists it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today and I'm sure our listeners would be uh, wanting to offer their thanks to you as well for putting yourselves out there and actually discussing the things that a lot of people have been thinking about so thank you very very much and don't forget that this recording will be available on youtube we will put the link on our twitter feed and we'll send it out to our participants our attendees as well thank you all very much and, and please get in touch if there is anything from the session today um, that you want to follow up on please get in touch with us and i think you've all got our emails uh, anyway and that's yes know. so thank you from us and uh, we wish you a safe uh, journey home if you are actually journeying home and stay safe from COVID. So see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye now.